All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with our scripture. We're talking about the, the, the Moses story. Um, and to recap from times past, um, Moses has uh, fought with his brother, um, put plagues on Egypt, and now they're getting ready to march out. And that's where this scripture picks up. Now, and when, you know, I've got to move this so I can see the scripture. Hang on. There we go. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side, so that neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hands over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. The Israelites went through the sea on dry land with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so they had difficulty driving, and the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots, chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hands over the sea, and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them back into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of the Pharaoh had been swallowed, that, that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them had survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on the left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and, saw Isra and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. So everyone's familiar with this story. This is the quintessential childhood biblical story and I picture the the felt board you guys remember the felt board with the with the moving parts and someone reading the story and moving the people across the felt board um and I also picture the movie with uh, it's Charlton Heston I don't know it just I don't have real connected images of this story and when I was searching to prepare for this I mean, it's not hard to search it. You type in Exodus. And I found a story about refugees from Syria. And I don't bring that up to be political. It's just, it brings it home. Um, there's a guy named Hassan Akkad, A-K-K-A-D. He lived in Syria. He's a normal guy. He was a school teacher. And he, he spoke about the, uh, his, they made, he made a video of his t time going across. He just had a GoPro and he filmed as much as he could while he was going from, from Turkey to Greece. Um, so he was a normal guy, school teacher. He went out, had fun with his friends, watched soccer games, lived life like we do. And in fact, those were his words. He said, I live the same life that you guys live. He was, when he's telling the story, he's in London. And he, said the, the, the reason that I had to go across the sea was I couldn't get a passport. My country was at war and none of the government offices were working. So we made a choice, as did many people, let's go. So he sold everything. And I, that's where you start picturing 
all of your things around you, each one of us in our homes. So he's selling everything to get into a little dinghy and go across the sea. The Israelites were slaves, a little different situation, but they decided to let's get out of this horrible situation and move to a better one, not knowing what it's going to be. And, you know, Hassan didn't know what it was going to be. He had pictured Europe as a very great place. Um, that was his, his um, maybe naive picture of where he was going. So they're on a little dinghy and they're going across the water and the, the boat starts taking on water just from the waves across the, the water. So they, everybody started throwing everything they had with them, you know, which is their life. You consolidate your life into one package and they had to abandon that. So they threw that over. There's footage of them on the boat really doing a call and response just to try and um, make it through this very scary time. Um, someone would say God is good and the, the whole boat, there's probably 50 people on this boat. All of them would say God is good. You know, just trying to get through this, singing songs. And I picture the Israelites. They weren't just marching along all happy with their rucksack on their back, trying to get away from the Egyptians. It was a scary, unknown time. And then they meet up with the water that's, you know, a dead end. Where do we go from here? Um, so we'll read. No, I'll read that later. Um, his story was Hassan's story. Um, they make it across after a couple of attempts in sunken boats. They make it across to Greece and they make their way through Greece and they have to hire smugglers to get them across the next part of the journey. Um, so he said, we gave, so he said, I, I sold everything and I gave all of my money that I had to a guy that I don't know, who I know is a, a human trafficker and it's going to take me across to across Hungary at that point, actually, to a, a safe place. And they get to the border and the guy said, all right, I'm going to slow down and you're just going to jump out. And he said, well, can we just stop and I'll get out? And he said, no, this is the way it's going to work. And they're in, it's in the middle of the night. He jumps out of a car, has no idea where he is, and he sees many other people that have jumped out of moving cars as they make their way across Europe to a place that will accept them. Um, you know, the Israelites had been roaming around for years um, trying to find a place that would accept them. So the, the stories here are very, very connected and similar, not connected, but similar. And you try and put yourself in that position and the fear and the unknown, just that part of it would be paralyzing. Um, before the Israelites left, there were many that wanted to stay because being a slave, as bad as that may be, was better than the unknown. So there was division at the beginning of this journey that some of them didn't want to go and they wanted to stay in a horrible situation because that was comfortable and that was at least familiar and not as scary as this journey to who knows what. Um, and if they could only rely on the, the words in Deuteronomy, which didn't exist yet, they could have found some solace in that. Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. And I'm sure that Hassan didn't 
have those words to be with them, but we have to find something to help us make it through the tough times. The, and, and saying it like that, the tough times, make, puts it in, it makes it too trivial too. It's really, how do we respond to the choices that we have? Um, there's another story about a guy who had, uh, he grew up in, in South Carolina and his dad had a barbecue restaurant um, and cooked whole hogs. And that was their deal. And they lived out in kind of the sticks. Um, and this guy's name is Rodney Scott. And he graduated from high school and he remembers the day of graduation being so full of hope and so full of the world is my oyster, I can do anything. And then a woman reminded him, um, you know, one of his neighbors that he's not going anywhere. He's going right down the street to his dad's barbecue place and working. And all hope was extinguished from his life. He was, this is my life the next 40 plus years. I'm going to be working, cooking hogs, which he liked, but it still took away every bit of hope he had. Um, and he worked directly under his dad. He, and he said his words were, my dad ran the business with, an, with, with a closed fist. And he wasn't open to new ideas and wasn't open to especially input from Rodney. It was, we do it this way and this is the way we do it. He did learn discipline through that. So after years of working with his father in that very regimented way, he appreciated the, the routine and the discipline. And then his dad had health issues. So Rodney was forced to take over the business. Um, through a series of events, Rodney changed some of the, the way they cook and a little bit of marketing, not much at all. And a, a newspaper in Charleston which was three hours away, um, had found the restaurant and was in love with it. Um, people started coming because of the articles that were written and he was offered to um, open up a restaurant in Charleston. Refused because this is what he knew. Um, and he said, I finally decided to open my fist because that's what he was taught to, to the way to proceed and be open to new things. He, right before the restaurant opened, his restaurant there in the little small town he was in burned. So he is devastated. He's got nothing at this point. The guy in Charleston said, let's do a pop-up restaurant. They did a pop-up tour because word of this guy's restaurant had gone viral. Um, and he had kind of a cult following so they did, I don't know, 10 cities. I'm making that up. It's something like that. Um, went around the country and he raised enough money doing that pop-up restaurant tour that he was able to open a restaurant in Charleston. He still operated both. He kept his mom um, working at the other one and, and he was bouncing back and forth between the two. And he is regarded as like the last person to cook on an open fire with whole hogs, the, the traditional way. Um, the restaurant's crazy successful and beyond anything he could imagine. Um, and it's because he was open to something new and willing to try. And his relationship with his father, because he opened this new restaurant was strained even further. And that this, the one thing he regrets, he said, is that my father and I don't really have a relationship now because I moved on. And he wished his dad would open his fist and be willing to accept something new. That's a huge, you know, chasm between those two. And, you know, it's still ongoing. Um, and I'm not asking us to 
diverge our lives into moving from our house and selling everything or trying a new restaurant. There are things in our life that are simple decisions that we make that we stay in our comfort zone with a closed fist. What are those areas in our life that we sit in this exact same position and don't take that next step to go forward? Um, it's, it's about stepping forward with courage. And one, one last little story is the story of TJ. who, um, as everyone knows, is at Baker and is playing soccer. And through the whole pandemic, from you know March to when he left for school in August, um, he really worked on his fitness, on his soccer skills. Our backyard is dirt because he worked every day out there. Um, and he did have a defender with him. Our dog would, would stand in front of him and block the ball and, or try and get the ball from him. So he, he had a little bit of help. Um, but he's worked incredibly hard and put his whole self into this. Wednesday, so this coming Wednesday is their first game and it's an away game. And there's 50 kids that are on the team. Um, only 18 kids travel with the travel team. So 50 down to 18. And just this past Wednesday, he learned that he wasn't going to be one of the 18, which would be expected for a freshman. Freshmen typically don't travel with the team. TJ was devastated and angry and frustrated um, really at the, the, the anger made it even, you couldn't reason with him and say, give advice and say, offer anything to help because he was so hurt by the decision that the coach made. Um, so you kind of have to let him go on his own and deal with that internally and see where he comes out. Um, so TJ has got a choice. What do I do? Do I throw in the towel? Do I work with what they've given me, which is not where I want to be, but on a different spot. And ultimately TJ has decided to, to stay with it and to um, keep plugging forward. And I, Part of me wanted to tell TJ, this is a test from the coach. It's not going to hurt him to not have you go with the travel team. He's testing your metal, testing your moral fibers to see where you stand. How do you deal with this adversity? Um, he met with the coaches, which I thought was a huge step for him to go have set up a meeting. And they reassured him that he is on the right path and that, that this setback is not really a setback to them. They don't view it as that. They view it as him getting better, him learning, and has brought him around to be, to understand that this is the way it works and it's okay. And you can still go forward. You can still know that you're working hard is making a difference. Um, just like the guys going from Turkey to Greece, three different boats that they were on that, well, two, two that sank and, and um, one that made it, it wasn't their first attempt. It's not always going to be the first attempt that gets you from point A to point B. Um, and all of these ideas, stories, the, the Israelites, um, 
you know, the, the, the scripture that I read really is very impersonal and very factual. When you think about the people that were there and the choices that they made to get to that point and to put their faith in someone else and persevere forward and be courageous and move forward is a huge lesson for all of us. Um, the main thing I think about is how do you go forward? How do you put your trust in someone else? And how do you be courageous? So I'll read Deuteronomy again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified. For the Lord your God goes with you. And that's what I've got.